What's going on guys? My name is Raging Rapt and I welcome you to the newest iteration of What Weekly News. Today we have the news from the 10th of April until the 17th of April. What do we have today? Well, we are going to lift the secret what this is. We're going finally to know what exactly is going on with the K91-2 and we have some changes to the E5 as well as the IS4 branch in the super test and we have three separate Q&As. So strap in, have a ch chill, maybe a beer, maybe a tea and relax with me where we'll go through all those weekly news. So first things first, let's start with this weird looking bar, which so many people ask what is going on with it? What is exactly this right now? It's fairly simple. It is just a progression bar, which Wargaming shows you different little tidbits about World of Tanks. All those questions are something from in-game. We don't really know it. Uh, well, just some random questions. They are in preparation for the 10th anniversary thingy which Wargaming is planning and in total the most important thing is you can all add everything up in this um, from those questions and you will get a bonus code and this bonus code is 1357 and this is the first piece of information we're having today it is fairly standard fairly easy you can use it um, only once but um, there are unlimited uses for unlimited users. And you will get five fire extinguishers and 25% booster for one hour for your experience earned. And those are the answers. If you don't want to see them, we can just skip them or you can just skip them. But yeah, you can look at them for yourself for the respective day. Now also, before we keep on going, I finally know what is going on with the K91-2. Apparently it is a second iteration, the first one being an older one. And now we have the second iteration of the K91-2 with its 360 Alpha gun. But now let's go to the super test where we are having a look at the changes of the KV-4, the ST-1, the IS-4, T-32 and T-110E5 because all those tanks got changes and they're most of the time nerfs. Again, don't forget that the changes we already had last week, like where the KV-4 gets 100 or 220 millimeters of turret front armor instead of just 180, as far as I remember. It's pretty sweet. It's pretty decent. But yeah, the first thing we are getting, the 122 millimeter gun of the KV-4 gets also eight degrees of gun depression, which should align to the same amount as what the 107 millimeter gun has. Then the ST1 gets some nurse to its DPM, which I personally think is totally legitimate because it got buffed quite heavily. The same goes for the IS-4. It keeps its armor buffs, it keeps its inaccuracy, inaccuracy nerf, but it keeps its accuracy on the move buffs, but they put down the DPM quite a bit again from 2600 to 2400 if we are rounding it up and down. Which is understandable, again, I personally don't really see the point in having a discounted 279 on tier 10. That's just my personal opinion and the IS-4 at the moment really did look like being a very, very strong tank. I still think the 279 as well as the Chieftain, I'm not sure if I've said 277 before, I meant 279. I do think 279 Chieftain as well as 430, you do need buffs to be in line with other tier 10 tanks. But sadly, so far, it doesn't really look like Wargaming is going to do that. The T110E, uh, excuse me, the T32 also received a nerf when it came to DPM. It isn't a too big 200 DPM less, but it's okay, I guess, because it is super frustrating to fight against a tank which you can't really penetrate, especially with the T32 with its incredible strong turret front armor. The T110E5 got hit the most with losing its accuracy buffs on the move and turret traverse. And it also receives a pretty hefty chunk of 300 DPM on the, well, reload time. That is pretty unlucky for the T110E5. I personally, when I'm looking at the T110E5 and compare it to its premium counterpart, there's some things which really, really desperately annoy me. Why? does Wargaming not make the T110E5 more mobile? Why does Wargaming think giving it better DPM will fix it? That's not the case. This won't fix this tank. I personally would give the T110E5 the same mobility as the Renegade. 45 kph top speed, 17 kph reverse speed. 
This would make a huge difference to the playstyle of the T125, especially if you're going to compare it to something like the s cock which has, well, 12 kph reverse speed, so as the E5. You know, it would make a huge difference in my opinion and really set the mobility apart from the s Conqueror. you know. So Place War Gaming, consider giving the E5s the same amount of mobility as the Tier 8 Premium has, which has the same playstyle, you know. That would be incredible good. So yeah, those were almost all the news we have, except for what Express is saying that they are thinking the competitive mode ranked will come back in summer 2020. We will see when the next season hits. Now, let's get to the biggest part of today's well, uh, weekly news. The whole Q&As. And they were interesting. There were three big streams with the developers and some bloggers. One of which was the Amway. Another one was Evil Granny. And lastly, I think there was another one, which um, um, Yushi Pro, Pro Tanky. So many, many things we can go through. I will skip through some which I don't think are super important and I will stay on others which are may or may not be more important. So <coughs> the first things is obviously that Wargaming, well, they are saying that they feel at the moment the coronavirus things going on. They are now working for three weeks now from home. I know this from a fact because at least the community team in Europe is working from home as well with Phil X being back in Germany and for example Iggy Boo is not allowed to be at the office as far as I know. But yeah so far they say they're actually more productive which is something you will notice as well when you are working from home because you don't need to go to um, to work with a car, you don't have traffic, as well as obviously meetings will be much more quicker as you don't have to all gather and so on and so forth. So here they're also saying something about playing with their tank for themselves and having their separate accounts without getting the 500 gold, you know, with buying stuff with their hard earned money gives them a different perspective. I'm going to skip up out of this. And the next thing is, they are saying that World of Tanks is going to live a long and happy life because, let's be honest, I also had the discussion today and I personally think that World of Tanks might be at a point where it is too big to fail, which is a little bit of a pity. I don't want to wish you ill to Wargaming. I do personally hope, however, that they are not taking everything for granted because basically saying that they are sure the game will live a long and happy life kind of has, an, in my personal opinion, a feeling that they are saying, yeah, we can do whatever we want, it will be alive anyway. That Like, this is an attitude, I just get the vibe from this. Obviously, this is translated by Google Translate from Russian from somebody which saw the stream, you know. So, it's a little bit off-putting to say the least. That's my personal opinion. I don't want to wish any will to the company nor any of the devs, but just reading this, it kind of feels like they are a little bit full of themselves or just thinking that they're too big to fail. And this is a very, very, very um, bad mindset in my personal view. So yeah, next up, they say the mo their audience, target audience is 25 to 35, which I 100% can sign because this is also what I am seeing from not only myself, but also from my YouTube audience being the most of 25 to 35. So they also saying that they have some things planned, even though they are now in quarantine in Russia and Ukraine. So they will monitor the situation for COVID-19 as well as the CIS region. And they're saying they sadly do not know who exactly did the DDoS attack. It's very hard to find out who did such DDoS attacks. However, they say they did learn things from it and they now have a much stronger anti-DDoS protection or infrastructure in place. And they're saying the Russian servers are at the moment um, in the way or they are at the moment in capacity to have around 1 million players online at the same time. Now, this is a bigger section about the amnesty for um, banned accounts or like the forgetting of what happened to banned accounts. When we are all breaking this down and this very, very weird-ish written and kind of weirdly formulated 
they basically say that people which are permanently banned will not be banned or will not get unbanned. It also depends what exactly caused that ban. And I, I, I still personally don't understand why exactly they want to do this. Maybe, and that's just a big fat maybe, it is an answer moment at the moment due to the fact that there are a lot of scammers out there right now which try to get your account details with those what replace wow great game and such stuff <coughs> um spam mail is going on because they can result in your account getting banned and sometimes even the support cannot be um effective against this so yeah it's kind of weird so i don't really know what i should be thinking about that but again I personally think if you're getting banned for a reason, then either you started to play legitimately or you just stop playing, you know, or you keep on playing with cheats or mods or hacks in that kind of sense. Or like mods which are not allowed, I should um, amplify. So yeah, next up, there's also a thing about Murasaur and apparently Murasaur is still working for Wargaming and I still kind of have a little bit of hatred for this guy because in my personal views he destroyed a lot of tanks and made the game as it is right now with tanks having no more frontal weak spots and this philosophy is still going on. I personally don't really like this, okay? But yeah, I kind of also don't get why exactly they are phrasing it like this. Um, he is on a secret project with a team of like-minded people. If everybody thinks like him in balancing wise, then it's a very, very bad thing. You need diverse thinking in balancing. That's my personal opinion on that. They're also saying he is cheerful, has a good seller, and he is pleased with everything. What he's doing now is very good at him, or for him rather. Again, why do we need to know this? Especially as I know a lot of people dislike the work Murasor did. Now we have the first small but nice thingy. Work on what classic is in progress, however, it is very slowly. And here, Mr. Um, Anton, Anton Pankov, the World of Tanks product director, he wishes for this to be going faster. But sadly enough, the priority is small. So it looks like Wargaming is planning on doing a VOVS World of, World of Warcraft classics type of client. Where you have World of Tanks Classic, maybe it will be premium account reliant or you have to do a known subscription. We don't know. But now we have some so like this, some statistics. First things first, the following cards are banned the most on the Russian server. Himmelsdorf, Ensk and Minsk. And those are the, gun, uh, the maps which are banned the least. Lakeville, Mountain Pass and Redshire. So you can see, and they're saying themselves, they notice that a lot of people are lately playing a lot more light tanks. And obviously this leads to tank maps like Minsk, Ensk or Himmelsdorf or in general city maps getting banned a little bit more. They are now talking about general tests being sometimes launched at wrong times and they are also pointing out that um, they don't want this to be an entertainment center. It is a server to test things, not where you can just shoot gold without limits. So then again, I have to say, why not make the tank server, for example, don't have any gold ammunition whatsoever, you know, if you want to test certain aspects of the general test, you know. But yeah. Next up, Modern Tanks, Tanks 2.0 as a separate game. The idea is cool and good, but we have so much work with the main world of tanks now that we haven't even got any time to raise our heads and think about it. There are no thoughts in this direction. Kind of weird because I got the information that they are kind of thinking of going further tiers like tier 13 with tanks like the T-62M or T-72M. It's kind of weird. You have contradicting information, so yeah. So, next up when it comes to statistics. Gold ammunition. They are saying that on tier 10, roughly 5 to 20% of the shells are filed gold, which are gold. They do point out, however, that in for, for certain game modes like the rank, there are percentages as high as 100%. The most tanks which don't need to shoot gold are Gorilla 15, IS-7 or Amex 13105, or rather the tanks which do not shoot gold at most tanks. And I can say that IS-7, that is correct. I do can. I am trying right now to free mark the IS-7 without shooting any gold ammunition and without using any rations. The tanks which shoot the most gold ammunition are the FV, which makes sense. Hash, the one um, T110E3, which kind of makes sense. 
and obviously the chief tart. So yeah, those make sense. Now here we have a little bit of an error. It's not Bonovoy store, it means bond shop and this is interesting. They do want to see when they're updating obviously how many um, bonds are still held by the players and how many bonds does the average player can get and how many bonds can the average player um, hoard on their account obviously. They want to see and use their prices like this. They do point out that they want to sell more 3D skins. However, it is a little bit sad that apparently they need a lot of labor to do this. I want to point out, the more 3D skins in this game and the less premium tanks, the better. Once again, and I had this discussion today with a friend, I personally think that how skins are implemented into the game, they are sadly enough not appealing to the, mo the broadest of audiences. Why, for example, should you pay 10 euros for a KV2 skin when you can buy for 15 euros the KV2 premium? You know, obviously you could say this is predatory marketing or other marketing strategies. <coughs> but yeah, I think you get what I want to say with that. I personally would like that if, for example, you have such a skin bought, that for example on a tank which is not a premium tank, you will get the added bonus of putting whatever crew you want into this tank. That would be cool. That would work well because you're not really making, they, you're just making them as crew trainers, but without really, you know, giving them the added benefits of getting more credits and getting more XP, etc, 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 like normal premium tanks have. Or at least think about giving those skins small bonuses like 5% less Reload, uh, no, excuse me, not 5% less repair cost, for example. No in game bonuses like reload speed, accuracy, etc., etc., etc. Just maybe less credits used to repair, maybe a little bit more XP earned for your crew. Something that it actually makes sense to buy those skins because I think skins are a great way to monetize the game. Yet, you're still waiting. The T22 average, IK, the T22 medium will not be available for bonds. Ah, that's a pity because I'm still waiting to get this tank. Might maybe next black market, who knows. Um, here about something about the T44 premium variants, we can skip about because it's Russian only. At the moment, we have no plans for the Waffenträger of E100. Here we go, guys. World of Tanks product designer or product leader said, no Waffenträger for you or Waffenträger, please. Keep that in mind. So far, there's no work underway on the new Battle Pass campaign. They want to see how the first season works and perhaps they will do something based on it. For example, what is the price? What are the contents in it for the next Battle Pass? There is no work underway on the 3.0 word refill program. So yeah, um, they do not want to sell the chieftain. It's a little bit weird. I don't really understand what it has to do with Czech Republic, but yeah. Next up, we have some information about the wheeled vehicles. They have two primary goals is that when you get damaged by the wheels, that the car will slow down more. That makes sense. Next, they will also see whether it helps or not. If it doesn't help, we'll go along the path of changing the performance characteristics, like reducing engine power, maneuverability. We also fix a couple of things with normal lights. They do want to think about giving experience on assisting for damaging vehicles. So that is a good thing. It's something I think a lot of people would already like to see when you're getting a little bit of a bonus for using or using assistant damage on wheels. So they also talk about efficiency and this is very important. Wheeled vehicles are high skill, high reward type of tanks. You need to have a lot of skill to perform in them very well. But if you are very skilled in those tanks. You can perform incredible well in them. This is what they're basically saying. This is something I personally noticed because in the end, in the end a guy which YOLOs your artillery, for example, which does the ducky, just YOLOs and dies, is not really, it, he's annoying, but it's not a big threat. A guy which knows what he's doing, which knows how to use the spotting system, which knows how to use his gun and his fuel range and mobility as well as camouflage, Here's the guy, which is incredible potent in this tank. And so it makes sense that Wargaming should probably try to tone it a little bit down, even though it will 
hamper worse player more than good players at the moment the tank is just overperforming because it gives all the tools to a good player to perform well in it yeah they do point out that wheel tanks die about the same speed as normal light tanks sure not everything goes break or breaks when you hit the wheels but they have overall less hp and that is the biggest issue Interesting facts. The wheels roll almost two times more kilometer than light tanks, despite the fact that these dynamics are only 20% higher. So that's probably because you can play more active in wheeled vehicles as you have more mobility to use. Even though it's just 20%, it's 20% enough to be an active scout. They do damage more opponents, but um, it's around 12% more than normal lights. Then the wheels often collide with other wheeled vehicles. That is kind of funny. And lastly, they say they want to do some offline events, but they don't know exactly what is going on. And lastly, there are some information about account cancellation, which I don't really understand. That was from the 15th of April. Let's jump to, excuse me, that was the 14th of April, if I'm not mistaken. Sorry, my bad right there. Uh, 11th. Now we have the 15th, which, oh, it's a lot again. This now we are talking to Andrei Belecki, creative director of World of Tanks. And we have Evil Granny, which is the YouTube blogger, or Andrei Somov. So, the creative director of World of Tanks says they are lacking end game content. He kind of has an envision of going towards this thing where they have an EVE online. But the issue is. Um, that it doesn't really work how it should be working in World of Tanks because they lack non-verbal communication and they are looking at something like an Apex Legends which they want to improve, um, Im implement into the game. They really do want to have a bigger thing going on which isn't just Clan War, something for solo players but also of which has their own economies, diplomacy, war, peace and is much more focused on on super groups rather than just one or two or four smaller clans, you know. So that's interesting that he says that, but it's something they were saying it's it would be make incredible cool, but it's very hard to achieve. Then they are saying they want to do um, PVE because it is definitely lacking in the game. Um, but they also want to say that maybe not always making the German spots, you know, maybe we want to play as the Germans and try to hold off a, a huge invasion of Russian tanks, for example. And that is an interesting quote here. They're saying that only 6% of the games are turbo games. What exactly do they classify as turbo games? 5.15 in 5 minutes? Because I personally say that this is a turbo game. Killing all enemies in five minutes and only losing five, that is very, very quickly, in my opinion. If you imagine that sometimes you wait, you have to drive for two minutes in to get into good positions. So, yeah, they are also saying that the pr issue is that, for example, in the 3-5-7 matchmaking, if your top two tanks die in the first minutes, the game is over, basically. And this is something I'm already talking about a lot, that you as a low-tier tank have a very, very little influence. Anyway... Next up, they are doing more tutorials for new players. So the training grounds will get improved, where you will get a, scar uh, a star system, where you can do different tasks for different classes. And if you fulfill them perfectly, you will get better rewards. A little bit like in World of Warships, where you have those PvE modes. Next up, he's talking about the maps in World of Tanks, and it's interesting, many, many, um, each time they introduce a new map, a lot of people love it, then suddenly one to five, 1.5 to 3 months later, everybody hates it, and after that, people get accustomed to them. And he kind of wants to do something um, where he can help new players or not so experienced players, where you can go as a platoon into one of those maps, and then you have like from the heat maps Wargaming has, like heat maps are which shows where exactly enemies are standing, roughly, or most of the time. There will be cardboard cutout, and you have to gather first ammunition, so you travel around the map, but then you have to kill the cardboard cutouts. So this could help people, and it would be an entertainment, entertaining way to keep people learning new maps. But yeah, next up, there is a new high-end content for solo players um, in the plannings, which is in addition to marks, master of tanks, etc., etc., etc. And it's an achievement system 2.0. It will be someday released. He dreamed that it will be this year, but it's very unlikely, so we will see it in 2021. 
Um, it's interesting, he says, there's still a lot of things to do. The pandemic is not helping, obviously, but apparently it is helping because they are more um, productive. Here, I don't really get what they're talking about art. So I'm going to skip about this. Because it could be just a mistake in translation. And again, I can't speak Russian. I'm using Google Translate for that. They are saying, however, that Tier 8 is the backbone of World of Tanks and most of games are played in tier 8 so this is why sometimes it's very hard for the matchmaker to do it properly. Less than 20% of the players really pick their customization settings for their tank and 80% of the players are just happy to just make one button, get a style, boom, finished. It's understandable, that's understandable. So I kind of get why Wargaming doesn't want to put too much work into customization when it's only less than 20% of the people using it but then again customization is a good way to do money and those people are already paying you to get Good customization, you know? I don't know. Next up, 25% RNG is important because it makes the games give emotions, negative and positive ones. We're coming to that statement in just a bit when we are talking about plus minus one matchmaking. Lastly, mm, they still have 40% of the players, at least in the Russian server, which are playing at a very low resolution. Understandable when you know what exactly is going on in Russia, but I'm not one to delve too deep into that. A roadmap which is designed every 12 months, it changes sadly a lot of the time they say and every quarter of the year they are going to review it and see what they can do. This statement is a little bit weird, but they are saying that at the moment 80 GMs will not be introduced into the normal World of Tanks game because they think they will be too effective against armor. Stun, and here we're going to talk about artillery. They say that stun is a little bit too annoying and it's, it's a big trouble. Before it was one shots, but they kind of want to do something. But they say the essence is that artillery is there to disturb the game flow and maybe also kill people which will otherwise be unvulnerable, like Chieftain or 279. Next up, they say the map editor they have two problems with. One being it is a very, very static tool apparently, which um, is on based on the ancient engine. And secondly, I don't know. They, they're saying everything that happens in the game happens on the server, so they want to keep it on the server. They don't want to have anything on local PCs because this could lead to cheating and so on, so on, so on. It's a little bit of a pity. We do need desperately need more maps, I think, in World of Tanks. So, yeah... Fan maps would be great, at least as an idea. I don't know, Wargaming, make up your mind. Next up, um, they discussed last week about the frontline um, tokens and the saying about the sell of them. They are thinking what they can do with them because right now they don't really want to make this as a grind where you have to 100% it as, an, as a discount, you know. So you don't really want them, they don't really want to sell tokens when you, for example, missed one. They also didn't have any idea yet what to do with um, all leftover tokens. For example, right now, if I keep on going and get every single token, and I will have one token too much because of the shenanigans at the first episode. So yeah, they don't know yet what to do with that. They also talked about that Frontline was made to be a tier 10 levels mode, but then they decided to do it something differently. And they are planning on doing a new 7 versus 7 mode. Ex well, they say they don't have any other modes for 9 and 10 levels, except for the 7 versus 7 mode, which was mentioned earlier. Um, they also say a draw in a platoon is very rare, 2.2 to 3% of the cases. So yeah, the problem is that, and for platoon plus minus 1, I'm not entirely sure what they mean with that. Like, their platoon should get plus minus 1 matchmaking, or plus minus 1. Oh no, now I get it, it's plus minus 1 platoon. So for example, uh, E25 could uh, platoon with a super hell uh, with a Hellcat. There you go, sorry. I was a little bit brain farting. I, even while I was <coughs> reading through it the first time, I didn't really get it. So I wanted to skip it. But they say the issue is the matchmaker would need to find a perfect match to that, so it isn't unfair. I don't know, I don't know. I actually like plus minus 1 matchmaking for platoons. Like that you were able to platoon with somebody which was one tier higher. Um, they are saying that enough time has passed that they not, no longer have only data by good players in wheeled vehicles. They also have data of bad players in wheeled vehicles. And it looks like they do, did notice that wheeled vehicles are a little bit too annoying. 
Next up, they also say about the bond shop, Bonovoy, I don't know, it's, it's an end translation error, but yeah. They do say that they want to also put into things like old frontline tanks, old 3D style stuff like that could be potentially in the bond shop, and I think this is totally fine. It's a totally good idea. And lastly, for this one, they're talking about the new crew system and the new equipment system. And there's not much to say about it, except for they're still not disclosing anything, except for it being more comfortable for most people or for all people. That's their point. They want to make it more comfortable for everybody. And the no new equipment, it will only be uh, additive and it will not replace anything. They want to offer some extras and new bonuses when you are using the new equipment. We'll be seeing how this is going to work out. Okay, the last one. And here we have very, very interesting things. Plus minus one matchmaking <coughs> and balancing in general. Or uh, excuse me, the ma matchmaker balancer. And here I quickly want to go through because those things are just statistics from the Russian server, which do not apply to our server. So yeah, they're saying bots do need a lot of... Um, computing power, hence why they do not want to introduce them to bigger populated servers. Also, neural networks are being tested. The issue is neural networks cannot debug, which makes sense. They are, um, they are organic, they re evolve themselves. Uh, a random server, the Russian server, does not have our bots. They do have our normal bots though. And yeah, again, they're saying it takes a lot of computing power. They said in 2019 they changed some server structure and in what a server can hold up to 130,000 players. And they say that <coughs> they can flawlessly hold 90 to 1, 950,000 players without any issue. Now, this is the most important thing right here. And something I personally and a lot of other people dislike. Plus minus one will make the current situation only worse and several respect aspects. So now, Wargaming is trying to explain why exactly plus minus one matchmaking will become worse. The variety of battles will become worse. The smaller the volume of tanks that can potentially get into battle, the more repetitive and of the same type they will become. Plus minus four in some ideal world would be even funner, funnier. That's their first argument. First things, there are already a lot of tanks in the game. There are enough to make the games varied. Second, the games actually became stale when you decided to implement a template system for 3.5.7 matchmaking or 5.10 matchmaking. Because suddenly you simply didn't have those outlayers where only two tanks in the whole game were low tiers. And suddenly it took away a lot from the variety. Sometimes you were the biggest, baddest guy where you were the best top tier tank, the only top tier tank. This is now gone. This was variety to me. Now it's just template after template after template. So I don't really think that this is a good argument. For plus minus four matchmaking, sounds weird. I do personally think that for scouts it could still work and would be hilarious. I liked the old scouting matchmaking, by the way. It was very fun because it felt so rewarding when you as a tier five tank were able to slaughter a tier eight tank. Next point. A game is a way to learn and way to generate emotions. There are no positive emotions without negative ones. That is such a stupid out point. It's literally how, like you would say, oh, without darkness, there wouldn't be light. Bruh, what the hell are you talking about? Like, for example, if I'm playing Borderlands 3, I literally only see great emotions in this game. This great writing, it's fun to play, it is so awkwardly funny. Sure, there are small things which are not good, but the great things outweigh it so much more. And I love to play this game. In World of Tanks, sometimes it just feels like a chore playing it. So, <coughs> sure, you can have some negative emotions because some things, there will never be anything perfect. But in World of Tanks, there are so many things which are negative that sometimes it just outweighs the positive, period. And Saying that you need negative emotions to have fun in World of Tanks is just a stupid assumption. It actually, I personally actually think that Wargaming in the statement says that they are actively targeting players with addictive behaviors. Because people with addictive behaviors will pick up much more on rewarding things and will much less dampen the, the negative things. Again, this is just my personal opinion and I don't want to say that Wargaming is a horrible company. 
It's just something I personally noticed or would say in that sense. I really dislike this argument because a great game with no flaws doesn't need any flaws. It, it, there will not, not be anything negative about it. And sure, complaining about things is much more easier than saying how to fix things. But it's simply such a stupid argument in my view. And it's, by God, it's triggering me actually a little bit. I think that it real like I don't really see joy when I'm, for example, I'm pl playing two seven nine, which I rarely do. A chieftain, I don't see the joy in farming tier eight tanks. Lately, I'm I'm trying to free mark the IS seven with AP only, and no rations. And it is so stupid when you're top tier and you can just drive into the face of a fifty three TP and he has no chance. He literally can't do anything. Does he have fun? I don't think so. I personally don't really see the point in wanking myself off and being like, oh, look at me, I can fuck you apart because I'm a two top tier tank. I, I, I know that some people like to do this, but <laughs> it's such an unhealthy thinking. <sighs> yeah. They're saying lastly that the wait times will obviously become much worse, um, not better, and I'm not talking about waiting time, however, and some levels will be much worse, which I simply don't understand again. Seriously, so many people like to play tier 9. Why? Because it basically is a 2 plus minus 1 matchmaking type of style. Your most tier 9 tanks are already pocket tier 10s and they don't have an issue fighting tier 10s. But they can fight tier 8s and most tier 8s don't really have a big issue fighting tier 9s. But the issue is tier 9s can face tier 7s and there we have a problem. Have fun in your IS fighting against the VKB at M103. Maybe an AMX M4, maybe a Type 4 Heavy, a Moise and you don't have a chance, you know? Or a very little chance, so that's just super annoying. In general, the whole plus minus one matchmaking debacle is so annoying because Wargaming literally does not try to make a test about it. Why not give us one week of testing and let us decide if it's good or not? Maybe make one server plus minus one matchmaking only and see where the people are going. That would help so much. Just test it. Don't make assumptions, Wargaming. Test it. This is one of the crucial, crucial things in engineering. I know you are doing software engineering and not mechanical engineering. Assumptions are good, but you have to have a fact, a test to see of if your assumptions are great. Just doing assumptions is bad. This is why you always should try to also fact check your stuff. And I usually try to do this, but sometimes I'm also just assuming. Again, same thing I'm doing sometimes here. But in this sense, please, Wargaming, don't just assume that it will be worse without testing it. Please test it. And don't say gibberish like, oh, we tried internal tests. Make a large-scale test on the live servers. Make it for one week. See if player numbers drop. If they drop, good. You can say us. You, you, seriously, if, if you are right and we do a test like this, you can look down on us and say, we told you, we told you one plus minus one matchmaking is not good. You, you can look down on us and say we were right, but please test it. Please test it. Next up, it is something about 3D styles where they say that the new can Kantemo um, Irovet style for the T3485 cannot be applied to the Rudy because the Rudy is intellectual property and the T3585M has a different model and it would need a lot more work on it. Also, the tank changes or the nation changes of the Rudy is not really popular. Go figure. R um, the Polish tech tree is a tier 10 with tier 10 heavy tanks or a heavy tank tech tree, so medium tanks will not be very useful. Also, there are other tanks out there which could benefit from this <coughs> change of nations. Again, M48 ram pumps, it would actually raise its value a little bit, even though it's a shit, shit tank. But yeah, they say they, they do have everything set up. They might do it, but it's not as popular for the players. Again, you are using a tank and a nation which is rarely used. Sorry, but that's how it is. Um, what did I... What they try to do with 3D style is to not affect the perception of the collision models of those tanks. The issue is that that is partially true, but sometimes, for example, the T57 Heavy, it can start to get a little bit annoying for newer players to know, well, is this part of the damage model? And, for example, it can actually be annoying to try and hit this cupola. 
On another hand, actually it can give an advantage to the enemy when you are using a 3D style, like on the IS-7. Because the IS-7s, it's Top guns, they're literally looking at the direction you're looking. So an enemy can much, much easier see where you are looking in an IS-7 because those guns are literally pointing at where you are looking. So it's kind of hard to tell. I personally still like the 3D stats. Don't get me wrong, they're amazing. It's great that Wargaming is doing them. Sometimes I'm just a little bit saddened, as already mentioned, that we lack other things like, man um, like helpings when you're using those camos or something like that. Speaking of which, didn't the 140 got a 3D style? Maybe I am failing to notice it. Ah, there he is. Yeah, it did got a 3D style. So for example, this 3D style for the Object 140, it looks great. There is not really anything added to it which clusters everything up. Sure, this could cluster a little bit, but the basic tank looks still great. The basic tank, there's not much added to it. The Object 277 actually got a little bit easier, in my opinion, to hit because of this lower plate being much more pronounced and actually showing you where the lower plate is. So yeah, it's a give and a get take. Um, this one I'm going to skip again because it is about artillery on Russian server. Point is, I want to point out that on tier 10 only battles, 41% of the games are with free RSPGs. That's almost... that's. That's a lot. That's seriously a lot wargaming. 33% are into... Again, if you want to play artillery, then have a wait, long wait queue, period. 41% of the games is too much where there are free artillery pieces. In free level battles, like tier 8, tier 9, and tier 10, <coughs> that's fine. You can see it. 15, 26, 35, for free 2, and 1. That's great. And look, no SPGs, 6%, year 22. There are way too many tier 10 SPGs, period. So, here I kind of have to skip over it because I am not entirely percent sure what they mean with art. I think they mean, or the um, translation is lost, that it goes about talking without really talking, non-verbal communication, for example. Text features, such things. Yeah. Here is a huge thing, and basically they are saying that everything is already calculated on the server when it comes to shooting. Like, everything RNG based is already calculated on the server, and the server, or like the client, we as the players, when we press the button, is connecting to the server and saying, give me a random number. And the server is like, sure, here you go. And this basically means you don't have any predictability, which is incredibly stupid for me as a player which knows the game mechanics. Because, for example, you get tricked into the thinking that you, as a player, can say, oh, my shot went too high twice, now I'm going to aim. I know that the shot will go either middle or low, so I'm aiming higher. You can't do this, even though it's very, very something you as a person will do. Or, for example, oh, I did a low roll this time, now I will do a high roll. Those are all the things that you usually will think about to get predictability into something. And this is in World of Tanks not the case, which is incredibly bad, in my personal opinion. But yeah, it's a huge chunk which I don't really want to talk about. It's just kind of annoying how they're handling it, that it's real RNG and not predictable RNG. It takes away of skill. Next up, the AMX 30B is a, is a tank which isn't comfortable, but according to the stats, it's good. Well, because a lot of play players are trying to free mark this tank because it's like this bad. So yeah. I don't know. They don't really change it because their stats say it's good. What the hell? Whatever. Tier 10 inflation because it's inevitable. Inevitable. Makes sense. But they want to make it slow. Why exactly do you have 279 Chieftain then? Yeah. They're talking here about the norm indicator, which I'm going to skip over. Um, there was a T62M and it was a little bit of an Easter egg. And um, they might be planning level 13 or level 14. The tank is very scary because it's ATGM, smoothbore guns, and so on, so on, so on. Um, and here, I think the last things they're talking about is um, the interchanging between different servers, which they dropped. They are working on a subscription system for World of Warships, which is okay, I guess. There are no plans for collectors in World of Tanks in 2020. Um, I'm not really sure if they meant collector vehicles or the long-deserved reward. 
don't know. Something more about the DDoS attack. And lastly, clicks in the random map in the mini map will be changed to be as like in war in frontline, which is great in my opinion. Lastly, people who in 2013 made notes and were engaged in the game sadly are no longer part of the company. That's a bit sad because maybe some of the passion for the game went. Who knows? It's the same thing when you, for example, say that uh, the newest Need for Speed, which um, Need for Speed Heat was made by Ghost Games, which is a company which was renowned for freaking up Need for Speed. Now the next Need for Speed will be ma made by X Criterion. And many people of those X Criterions, on which back in the days did Burnout, which was such a huge hit, um, are not even part of this company anymore, you know? It's kind of hard to tell which, yeah, maybe it's part of that. So lastly, they're talking quickly about Expedition 2020 and they say they're not, um, they didn't want that the people, the main reward is one tank. That's the main reward. The second tank is an additional reward. It's for the dedicated players, which makes sense, which makes totally sense. Because so far it doesn't really look like it. You will never have the chance ever again to get those tanks. It will just take a long time. So yeah. But they can't really give us any ideas yet. They want to talk about details, but they aren't just right there yet. For the Steel Hunter mode, maybe we'll get in the next couple of months or next week some more information. <sighs> okay, now I am literally done so. We do have an XP event on the EU server, which is neat, but um, you can do it up to three times a day. It's not a little much you can get. And you get a four times XP boost to per for your first win. I'm quickly going to re um, refresh the website if there's anything new. There isn't. And that's just a model by an, which uh, from from a guy which worked three years ago at Wargaming. This is just a home training program. So yeah. Case and point, that was the weekly World of Tanks news. I'm super sorry that it was such a long vehicle, but sometimes that's how it is. That's how um, those videos go. Now we have a 47 minute long video about um, Q&As. I'm going to leave the links to the Q&As in the description below. They are incredible long. You can read for them yourselves. Use the Google Translate. It does a pretty decent job. Again, some things aren't entirely correct. Please let me know in the comment section below what you think. And for the people which actually managed to listen to me for 45 fucking minutes, um, next time I may or may not do this because I may simply stretch it apart. Like make different videos for the different Q&As because that video was exhausting. And now I have to do it in Germany. My name is Raging Raptor. If you enjoy such content, let me know with a thumbs up, with a feedback, a comment, and obviously a sub if you're new to the channel. Hope you have a great day, have a great weekend, and I'll talk to you on a different video. Cheers, guys.